Shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome, world changers. Tonight we are getting into uh, the book of James again. It is going to be an awesome, awesome night as always. I have a question, not a question per se, but a comment that I received on YouTube that I want to address uh, before we get into that. But uh, before that, see what's going on here in the chat. We have Colomento says, uh, shalom, everyone. Billy says, shalom. Uh, Vinny says, shalom, everyone. And Muhib says, as salamu alaykum. Uh, Great Deception says, shalom, everyone. Shalom, shalom, shalom. Welcome, welcome. And peace be multiplied to each one of you. And blessings. Good to see you here. Yes, another day of reading and discussing and fellowship and all that great stuff. As always, I pray that uh, everything that we share today and everything we read is is going to be uh, for your edification and to bless and to encourage and to instruct and increase our knowledge of the scriptures and the wisdom of God and the things of, of God and, and to in, in increase our relationship with him. So I have a comment here that I received, well, as it says here, 21 hours ago, and this is a comment. Now, this is not really, um, the topic for the night, but um, since this comment came in recently, and uh, I think it's worth at least addressing here, we have Campers Town RV Sale. Sounds interesting, by the way. It says, I'm surprised. Now, this is on the um, uh, the video, the Didache. Uh, this is actually a, an old video, actually, the Didache teaching of the 12 apostles reading and and video. So I'm surprised to hear the comment about Paul not being part of the 12. And basically, okay, well, first of all, oh, sorry about that. First of all, um, yeah, he's not part of the 12. I mean, uh, we want the truth. And this is the reason why uh, I, I get this a lot. And and this is, and I understand the reason why I get this. You know, I, we, we say, th we think for ourselves, we think for ourselves uh, we read the scriptures for ourselves. We pray. Um, we seek the truth. And unfortunately, a lot of times what the church teaches is a corrupt narrative that's that has been corrupted over the... I mean, there's been a lot of time for corruption to set in. I mean, it's like a, it's like a river, the river downstream. We're 2,000 years downstream. That's a lot of time for a lot of pollution and dirt to get polluted uh, to get caught up in the water on the way down. So we want to go right to the source. We want to go right to the where the purest, most, you know, clearest, cleanest water is back to the first century. And, you know, it's, it's just the truth. I mean, hey, I mean, a lot of times you have to decide between the truth and what the church teaches you. Now, different churches teach different things. I know that. But, uh, you know, a lot of some churches, at least, they would teach that Paul is part of the 12, but he's not. He really is not. We know that from church history. Not just, I'm not just saying it, okay? I'm not just saying it. We know that from Paul himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, you know, uh, the 12, like he spoke of, third, like he's talking about somebody else. He's talking about the 12. You know, even in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, you know what? Let's just quickly go over there because uh, since I'm, I'm referring to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Might as well go over there just for a moment to uh, to have a look at this. So uh, let me just pull up the screen here. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, Paul is, well, he's commonly, you know, he says things that seems to uh, contradict each other all the time. But this is one thing, okay? Um, so, Okay, see what we have here. Okay, speaking of the resurrection, uh, he said, after that, he that would be Jesus or Yeshua, excuse me, appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, uh, though uh, some have fallen asleep, meaning have, have passed away. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, then also to me, uh, to me also as one abnormally born. Now in, I'm reading here, 
uh, just a second here. So, uh, just a second. Here we are. I actually missed. Yeah, he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. I should have met, I should have mentioned that. So this is First Corinthians fifteen five. So obviously um, Paul is not part of the twelve because he said he appeared. He appeared to Cephas or Peter, then to the twelve. So uh, he does not count himself as part of the twelve because later on he uh, he said, "I am the least of all the apostles." Okay. Now keep in mind there is a difference, a great difference between disciples and, and apostles. Um, you can be a disciple without an apostle, without being an apostle, or you can be an apostle without being a disciple. Um, so the 12 disciples were apostles too, because they were sent. The word disciple means simply student. The word apostle means one that is sent. So you can be a student without actually being sent. So you're a disciple, not an apostle. And you can be sent without actually being a student. Okay, that's being an apostle, not a disciple. So we have the 12 disciples who actually became apostles through the great uh, commission and they all went out and preaching the gospel into all the world, or at least in all their part of the world, at least. Okay. Relatively speaking. Um, and that was long before Paul ever come, come onto the scene. He was never a disciple. Paul was never a disciple. Jesus didn't call him. Um, remember Jesus, as we read just recently in the, in the gospel of Mark, Jesus is a Jewish rabbi who went to the synagogue, preached in the synagogue, or taught in the synagogue as a rabbi. And as a rabbi, um, he had his students. He was a teacher. He was a rabbi. He was a student. The students he had, which was, dis you know, all rabbis had their disciples. He was one who had disciples. Uh, wasn't anything out of the ordinary. It was just a common thing in that part of the world, and you know, in that culture. So, the disciples were like the students, and the rabbi was like the professor or the teacher. And so the students of Yeshua, of Jesus, actually lived with him, basically. They lived uh, you know, in, in the, in the uh, they stayed in the dorm, okay? They lived at the school of Yeshua, basically. Day in and day out, they were, you know, they, you know, night in, night out. Uh, they were, they were with uh, the, 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 the teacher, and they got trained. It's like a three and a half year course. You got trained, hands on training. Okay. And like a deck, like after the crucifixion and all, like after the fact, after they went out into all the world, after all that stuff, it's like they figure about, about a decade. And some people believe it's even longer than that. Paul finally comes around. F Paul finally comes around. He was a, an apostle not really a disciple. He wasn't a student. Uh, never even met Jesus in the flesh, as far as we know. Uh, he wasn't there. Jesus ca didn't call him. He could have called him. He didn't call him. Uh, he was AWOL. <laughs> well, he wasn't even expected to be there. So all of the 12 disciples had much more experience, m uh, much more authority than Paul ever did or ever would have. Even his own admission, he says, I am the least of all of the apostles. Now, keep in mind, there are way more than 12 apostles. There's only 12 original disciples, the 12. But apostles, there's potentially millions of apostles. Okay? So don't get me wrong. Um, you can Millions of people can be apostles, okay? It doesn't have to be just the 12. Actually, billions of people can be apostles. There's, there's, there's no limit to it. But the disciples, there was a limit because Jesus only called those 12. In fact, someone could argue he didn't call Judas. We don't have any record of him calling Judas. We have record of him calling other people. So Paul had, um, Paul came in, even as, actually just read his own words here, okay? I am the least of all the apostles. Do, do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, okay? But by the grace of God, I am what I am, okay? So he goes on to say, okay, let me see. Maybe it's before this, where he says, basically, I'm as one born out of due time. Uh, yeah, right here, verse 8. And last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born, or as it says in other translations, one born out of due time. 
basically what he's saying, okay, in modern terms, it would be, I missed the bus. I came, I'm Johnny come lately. I missed it all. I missed everything. I missed the baptism. I missed the, all of the miracles. I missed all of the teachings of Jesus. I missed walking with him and talking with him and learning. And I missed the three and a half years or what, three, however much time it was. Some people argue more. Some people argue less. Whatever it was, he missed it all. He missed it. So Paul can come in and someone might argue, well, Paul, you know, he has, you know, um, um, you know, God showed him revelations and God, you know, God taught him himself. Well, okay. If you were, if you were in an airplane, let's say you're in a private airplane, it's you and a co-pilot and a pilot. Okay. The pilot has a, it goes into cardiac arrest. He dies on the spot. Okay. Um, well, let me just put it this way. Let's say it's you and two other two other people and then the pilot, okay? So the, the pilot has a cardiac arrest, dies on the spot. The plane is going to, to nosedive. The plane is going to crash. There's two other people with you. One person said, I was with the, with, with the pilot when he was instructed. I mean, we were, we were instructed together. I don't really have the papers to, to prove it, but we were instructed together. Uh, I have witnesses to prove it. Uh, I was there. I, I audited the course. I sat through the whole course. You know, I was, I got trained as well, basically, although it's not formally trained. And, and then someone else says, but I had a vision from God. Who are you going to want to put into the, into the cockpit? Someone who has actually been trained by the same instructor as the, as the pilot or someone who just had a vision? You know what I'm saying? My own opinion, I would want the person who was physically, literally there, trained by the same instructor as the pilot. You get in the cockpit. Uh, I trust you. This guy over here, he said he has a vision. He had a vision. Well, that's whatever. I mean, we have to test that. We have, you know, uh, that is what it is. But you have the hands-on experience. You get into the cockpit. That's what happened with in, in Acts chapter 1, when Judas um, needed to be replaced. They're like, who are we going to choose to, to replace? Actually, Paul wasn't even there, so it's not even a, you know, uh, it's not even an option. Paul wasn't even there at that time. How, who, are we, who are we going to choose to replace Judas? What did they choose? They, it says they, they chose someone who, well, first of all, the requirements was whoever it was, or whoever it is that replaces Judas had to be somebody that was there from the baptism all the way through to the resurrection and eyewitnesses of everything. In other words, that person had it. We have to pick someone who, who has audited the course, who has been through the program. Joseph was. Joseph was Joseph was was with the entire you know the entire crew. Apparently, you know there were the twelve disciples, like the officially enrolled you know students, and then there were the people that were hanging out in the background, uh, auditing the course. Joseph was one. Matthias was one. Like okay, they're both. They both seem to be good, like perfect replacements for for Judas. But it's hard for us to. Um, it's hard for us to. To put a finger on one or the other, so let's let's do what always has been done, and that is, according to the scriptures, pray and cast lots, and trust that God speaks through that, which He always has done, and He did. He spoke through it. Chose Matthias, Matthias, who had, by the way, Matthias, because of his experience, because of him being trained, because of him auditing the course, he, even Matthias, had way way more authority than Paul ever had or ever would have. And so Matthias replaced Judas. And somebody might say, no, 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 uh, Paul came in and kicked Matthias out later. W where's your evidence? I've got evidence from the early church fathers that say that Matthias uh, replaced Judas. The early church fathers said that Matthias replaced Judas. 
I mean, the ones that that re, that that succeeded after the twelve disciples, they said that Matthias. They confirmed that Matthias, Matthias was actually the one who replaced Judas. Not only that, but church history tells us that Andrew, the disciple, and Matthias, the disciple, <laughs> the, the the disciple who audited the course, Andrew Matthias went north into uh like uh Syria and uh, up in that part of the uh the world and then finally at, at, you know went up uh even northern than that like they they went up into that part of the world shortly after the um the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 they fulfilled the great commission they obeyed the the, the teacher go into all the world preach the gospel so they went and they started preaching Matthias so the 12 the, the 12 disciples with perhaps the exception of James, because James stayed at Jerusalem, and Peter, but the other at least 10, they went out into all the world. All right? We have Timothy, um, or Thomas, I should say, going down into um, uh, India, of course, and, and some uh, uh, evidence in, in uh, historical um, documents say that he actually traveled down into Africa for a little bit as well. But they went. They went. Long before Paul ever, he was at, he wasn't even on the scene. Again, Paul, according to his own according to his own words, was, he came in late. Least of all the apostles. So what is so what does the church do? The church. Goes, oh, Paul! Paul said he's the least of all. He's the greatest of all the apostles. Look at how he was treated in Acts chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, the council of Jerusalem, when uh, men of Judea went out saying, well, you know, if, um, you know, these Gentiles, they need to start obeying some, you know, they need to obey the, the Torah. They need to, you know, they, get, they got the circumcision and all that kind of stuff going on. This is what they need to do. Gentiles need to do this. Paul and Barnabas had a problem with that, okay? As you can just imagine, Paul being Paul, he would certainly have a big problem with that. They didn't have authority to say anything about it. It says they, they, had, they had to go to Jerusalem to escalate the matter to the actual authorities, Peter and especially James. Now, when they went to Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15, James didn't say, like, they were, they were there at the quote unquote church, if you will. Peter and James didn't say, oh, oh, here's oh, Paul. What's going on, Paul? Well, you see, we got these people going around saying that, you know, the Gentiles have to have to do this and that and everything else to get saved. Now, they could have said, which they didn't, they did not say this, but they they could have said, oh, Paul, you're the apostle to the Gentiles. You should know you're you're the expert in the matter. What 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 do you actually we should be asking you Paul because you are the apostle to the Gentiles. The, we're talking about the Gentiles now. This is not the Jews now. We're in Jerusalem. What are you, why are you coming to us for by the way? I mean, hey Paul, you have the authority. You're the Gentiles are yours. It's not what they said. They said actually they said the opposite. Acts chapter 15 verse 7. Peter is the first one to stand up and say, "God chose me that by my mouth that I that that uh, the the, the the gospel is to be preached by the Jews. And then finally, James brought down the final word. They didn't give Paul a word in a word in edgewise. They didn't ask Paul for opinions or anything, for guidance or anything. They didn't even ask Paul for a vote. It's like, oh, okay, Paul. Step back, Paul. We'll deal with this. And look in Acts chapter 21 as well. Look at how they look at how they handled Paul. Certainly not like how Christians believe it is today. Certainly not. Certainly not. So, um, uh, quickly finish up with the rest of your comment here. I'm surprised to hear the comment about Paul not being part of the Twelve. Well, yeah, it's, that's the truth. That's the truth. And basically using that as an argument to make him out to be a lesser apostle— well, basically not, because I'm using his own words. He said that he's the le lesser of an apostle, but he said he's the least of all the apostles. Okay? 
at least in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I mean, different parts of the scripture, he says different things. And like, as we, Campers Town RV Sales, if you're really, really interested, if you really, really want to dig into this, I encourage you, go back into the archive of all these lives that we did in the past month, because we went through every, um, let me think now. We went through all of the primary uh, books, epistles of Paul, all seven. Actually, we went through eight, I believe it was, of the primary epistles of Paul. And so we spoke all about that. So if you're really honest and you really want to look at this and study it more, I encourage you to go and check those videos out. We aired them not too long ago. Uh, the Bible... So. Campus Town goes, Bible actually states that Paul did not fall behind in any of them, but in fact worked hard. No, the Bible, well, it's, the Bible doesn't, the Bible is a, is a compilation of different books, vastly different books by vastly different authors from vastly different cultures and vastly different times, okay? Uh, so the Bible canon is of man, it's not of God. Okay, the Bible canon is of man. You need to understand that the Bible, as I'm not talking about all the all the books that are in the Bible. I'm talking about the Bible as a framework. That is a work of man, not a work of God. How do I? How can I say that? Maybe maybe that would surprise you as well for to hear someone say that. How can I say that? Because we have absolutely no evidence whatsoever that God has ever ever spoken to any pro prophet priest, king, anybody, and hey, I'm going to give you a list of 66 books, and this is going to be the Bible. I want you to slap Holy Bible on the front of it and chuck like, you know, three quarters of it into a category. It says Old Testament, and then, you know, and then the rest of it's in New Testament. Man did that, not God. In fact, I, am, I firmly believe that if we were to go back in time, to the days of the book of Acts, to, to the true New Testament church, to Peter and James. And we were to talk like, hey, biblical this, biblical that, Bible this, Bible that. They'd be like, what are you talking about? Well, you know, the Old Testament says, Old Testament? What are you talking about, Old Testament? What's the Old Testament? Well, you know, everything from Genesis to Malachi. They would be irate. I can just, you know, like the cartoon, steam coming out of their ears. How dare you? say that our scriptures is Old Testament. I'm just telling you the truth. How do I know? Because you look at it in Acts. They had to build everything on the Tanakh. I say Tanakh because that's really what it should be called and not the so-called Old Testament. That's what man calls it. They built everything on... The New Testament scriptures did not exist. Okay. And the ones that were like, when Paul wrote his letters, they weren't considered to be Holy Scripture. They were considered to be literal letters written by a man who sat down with his quill and wrote a letter to something and so, or somebody over here, Timothy over here, Philemon over here, whatever. And, you know, a group of a couple of friends that he met in Galatia and in Rome. This is what it, this is what they viewed it as. Well, that because the, it didn't exist at all in the first century. It wasn't until Marcion came around that started it all in the second century. So you can say Bible this, Bible that. I can tell you one thing. The Bible's not biblical. There's nowhere in the Bible does it talk about the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible does God ever say to even construct a Bible. It is an idol. Now, again, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about every book in the Bible. I'm talking about the actual framework of it. The list of books, if you will. Put it this way. I'm not talking about the, li the books in the li library. I'm talking about the library itself. The Bible is a library of books. It is an idol. And so what happens is a lot of people, especially Protestant, evangelical Christians, they end up worship worshiping the Bible, basically, idolizing the Bible. That's what they call bibliolatry. Bibliolatry, the idolization of the Bible. So it says the Bible actually states that Paul did not fall behind in any of them, but it, but in fact worked harder than them all. No, Paul said that. 
He said, I works harder, worked harder than them. Paul said that. Okay. Uh, it goes on to say, yet it was not her, it was not her, but the grace, or I guess you should say him, but the grace of God that was in him. This is not just Paul defending his status. Oh, yes, it is just Paul defending his status. There's nobody else that defended it. But it is the Bible's defense. Well, the Bible, again, you're putting a lot of faith in, in, in the work of man. And by the way, you don't even know who put the Bible together. You don't even know. And you're putting, you're staking your soul on, on the canon of the Bible. Please understand, in the, in the original, in biblical days, if you want to put it that way, in the first century, they did not have a Bible. They had the Tanakh. They had, you know, uh, many of the uh, same books that they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and they and they had it kept just like how the Dead Sea Scrolls were kept, different scrolls in different places, for a reason, because different books have different dynamics than other books. Different books were written by different people at different times. It helps keep everything. It helps you to sort things out in your mind instead of slapping it all together into one book and calling it Holy Bible. It's very misleading. I, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a, that the Bible is, is wrong in that sense. I have many Bibles, okay? I have many Bibles all around, everywhere. Um, I'm just saying it. the framework of the Bible canon is very conducive, and many people do worship it and idolize it, and it's not of God. Okay, it's just not of God. So the last sentence here, this is not just Paul defending his status. It is the Bible's defense. Well, yeah, it's Paul's. The Bible doesn't speak for itself. It doesn't say, I, the Bible, speak. It says, I, Paul. That's what it says. Uh, but it is the Bible's defense of Paul's status. <laughs> okay. I don't know what you get, where you get that from, uh, because as far as I read it, the Bible doesn't speak in and of itself. It, it is a collection of books. And it's Paul that spoke of for himself. It is, the Bible, it is the Bible's defense of Paul's status. I draw that conclusion by believing the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Again, going into all these clicheism. Does the Bible say that? That's why I say the Bible's not biblical. And once again, I want to make sure that everyone understands I'm not saying... I'm not attacking the books individually. I'm attacking the framework, the Bible canon, because it has been idolized. It's so many people engage in bibliolatry, and uh, I don't think they should. I think that they should they should look at it just like how Jesus looked at it. You want to be like W W? You want to do what Jesus would do? How did Jesus? Each book was kept in different places. Luke chapter 4, he stood up into the synagogue. He went to the synagogue as his custom was, and he got up to read. By the way, no, not, not just anybody could do that. They have to be certified. They have to be part of, the, of, that, um, uh, of that culture, I guess you would say, and known within the synagogue. They won't just let any Joe Blow get up and start speaking. You know, that Jesus was a rabbi, so he got up and started reading from, what, what does it say? They handed him what? The Holy Bible? The King James Version? No. No, they didn't. Did they hand him the Holy Bible? No. Did they hand him even the Tanakh? No. What did they hand him? The scroll of Isaiah. Because in those days, every one of the 24 books was kept separate, individual from each other. Jesus did not say, oh, you know, um, uh, how, what a pity you have Jeremiah over here and you have the Torah over here and you have Ruth in the back room. What a pity. Here, I'll give you a list. Put them all together and print them all together and, and call it all the Holy Bible. Oh, make sure you include Paul too. No, he did not say that. No. He did not say that. 
So that's my uh, response to that there, Campers Town RV Sales. I appreciate your comment. And um, if I had anybody like, if I heard my, I, I got to tell you something. 30 years ago, when I've really started studying the Bible, like just vehemently studying the Bible, if I heard people say what I'm saying right now, I'd probably, if I heard anybody say what I'm saying now, I'd probably feel uncomfortable because I just didn't know any better that, you know, that time. I, I just like most of us, you know, got involved with the church and, and started adopting all of the, you know, the memorized selling points of Christianity, the memorized, the road, Roman road of salvation and all the cliches, all this, all that stuff. I, I've been there. I've been there. But with more study, as, as time went on, as I studied more, as I read the scriptures more, as I studied the culture and the historical uh, context, I mean, the historical uh, framework of it as well, then I started realizing the Bible is not so simple. It's not so overly simplified. It's just like, oh, it's all the Word of God. Even Paul said in first, uh, hey, I'll leave you with this, camper. I'll leave you with this here, okay? Uh, you can even watch me go here, okay? So this is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 12. What did Paul say? Oh, I, I, should, I should speak like, like, a, like an evangelical, um, um, you know, fundamentalist here. What does the Word of God say? What is... What does the Word say? What does the Bible say? The, the Bible says, actually Paul says, Paul says, to the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. Paul said himself right there. This is my Word. This is not the Lord's Word. I'm saying this, not the Lord. Well, thank you, Paul, for letting us know. That's great. I love it. Paul didn't come around like I and say, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. He did that is when he quoted Isaiah. He didn't do it in and of himself, really. There might, I mean, what? The only time he ever said the Lord spoke to him was what? Through the thorn in the flesh? You know, as a Second Corinthians chapter 12. Might have been one other time. Maybe one other time. They, compare that with the other with the original 12 with the real 12 disciples they heard hundreds of thousands of words from the master's mouth paul heard even if you if you just if you just take the book of acts you know everywhere in the bible where it talks about what the lord said to paul it's not much it's not much Isaac, I just caught this caught my corner here. In my opinion, he doesn't get everything right, right, and digs up some good Bible gems worth considering. I agree. I agree, uh, Isaac. I'm, I, uh, you know, I actually I quote Paul a lot. I do. You know, he says a lot of good stuff. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying he doesn't, but uh, I don't believe what I used to believe. That you know, again, the whole the whole narrative that every single word that he spoke is is. Uh, is is for is God speaking to us today? You know. Anyways, thank you very much, Campers. What was it? Campers. Sorry, if I, Campers Town RV Sales. Thank you very much for your comment. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, just before we jump into James, let's see what else we have here. Jordan says Shalom. To Christopher Shalom again. again. Shalom, Jordan. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, it's a good point, Isaac. I, I you know, that's true. Uh, they were selected as apostles among the disciples a while before the Great Commission. True. Yes. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. Um, because you see the. Uh, 
Yeshua did send them out before the Great Commission. Like, so he sent them out, you know, we read about they sent them out two by two or sent them, you know, sent out the 70, sent out, you know, that kind of thing. So that did, in effect, make them apostles before the Great Commission. Yeah. Whenever Jesus sent them to do anything, that would, by definition, make them an, an apostle. So thank you, Isaac. Also, hi. Hi, Isaac. Tammy says, Shalom all. Shalom, Tammy. Welcome. Blessings, blessings to you and yours. ANBU Doc says, what do you think about the divorce and remarriage doctrine? Correct me if I'm wrong. I, 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 I have to assume here that you are speaking about the, the doctrine about Israel, you know, the God marrying Israel, then divorcing Israel, and then marrying Israel again. Uh, if that is what you are speaking, actually, you know what, before I answer that, could I, could I get, just get that confirmation? Is that the doctrine you're talking about? Um, because I did post a video recently in which I said that the Israel's Israel's divorce and remarriage doctrine is um, is something that I I don't to, and I have reasons for it. Anybody wants me wants to know what the reasons are? I'll gladly I'll gladly tell you. Um, is that what you're referring to? A N B U doc. Um, what I referred to in a recent video that I posted. Yeah, it's that's right, Isaac. There were there were others that were called apostles apart from the twelve, though. Yeah, um, Jesus is called the apostle in in Hebrews three. That's amazing. Yeah, and that's a good point. Another thing is too in uh, Acts chapter fourteen, it does speak of other apostles, not just the twelve. So yeah, excellent. Tower time says shalom and howdy, brothers and sisters. Bless y'all. Shalom and howdy. The tower time. Good to see you. God bless you more. Well, I'm so, so flattered that I am even... You know, like, just like... You know, Jesus said... Jesus said, if, if you're like the Master... I mean, I can't say I'm like the master, okay? But Jesus said, the more you become like the master, the more you'll, you know. He said, if if they persecute me, they, they'll they'll persecute you as well. If they if they call me evil, they'll call you evil as well. Well, I, I got that just here now. So, so Lord Jesus Christ is God. Says Satan is speaking to you here. What makes you think that? And this man is is a wolf. Watch out! Again, you you're making claim. What? Where's your evidence? What makes you what makes you believe that? Is it just because I said something that's against your dearly held beliefs that you don't have evidence? You believe it, but you don't have evidence why you believe it. You 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 bought into the modern corrupt Christian narrative, and and I came to shoot it down with the truth and. It, it upsets you. Um, is that what happens here? Or do you have evidence? Do you have evidence or is this just slander? Or is this just being a false witness? By the way, if you're slandering, which I do believe you are, and being a false witness, which I, I know you are, um, then you are, you are sinning against the very God you claim to serve. Yeah, even Andrew said, why do you say that? I would like to know too. What, what evidence? What do you have? What is your evidence?
Thank you, Isaac. Yeah, you know, that it's fine. It's fine. Isaac says, in my opinion, he doesn't get everything right, but he but he gets a lot right and digs up some good Bible gems worth these. Thank you. I appreciate that. Ezekiel says, Shalom, everyone. Shalom, Ezekiel. Good to see you. Blessings, blessings. Isaac said, I was just speaking, it was responding to that person speaking crap about you. Thank you very much, uh, Isaac. I appreciate that. And Corey says, Shalom, Chris. Shalom, shalom, Corey. Good to see you. ANBU says yes. That would be answering the question that I asked earlier about the uh, Israel's divorce and remarriage doctrine. Um. So, in a nutshell, I can't. We, we can get into it deep, but uh, I don't think that we all want to do that right now. But just in a nutshell, excuse me. In a nutshell, the doctrine is that. And this is what the CPOP things, right? It's just cherry picking, so just t- taking a passage here, a verse here, a passage there, and just stringing it all together and making a huge deal out of it. If that, if if that's the, if that is true, then why didn't God teach that doctrine to everyone, to every prophet? If it's so important, if it's so big, if it's if it's if if that is you know a, a you know uh, a thread that runs through. If that's like part of the uh, fabric of your faith, then why why didn't God, you know, tell anybody? Really, none of the church fathers speak, spoke about that, as far as I know. Um, of course, we don't read that in the Bible. It, it's the, uh, the you can't say Peter taught that, or James taught that, or, or John taught that, or anybody like that taught that. So. The doctrine is basically in a God marries Israel. Now, again, I believe this is just figurative, metaphorically speaking, of course. Um, and then and then somewhere down, you know, after a while, after hundreds of years, it says that God divorced Israel. Okay. Now again, this is all metaphorical, metaphorical um speak. And but it doesn't say that about Judah. So the doctrine is that that's the reason why Jesus came is because according to Deuteronomy 24, the husband has one of the husbands have to die in order for the other one to, uh, in order for the 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 wife to remarry, her husband has to die. Um. And so this is the problem with that. First of all, it does not fit. It does not fit what Deuteronomy 24 is actually teaching. Deuteronomy 24 actually teaches that if 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 uh, you have a husband and a wife, and they get divorced, and the woman marries another man, that woman cannot go back to the former husband. You know that's what it teaches basically. So it does not fit the profile. On top of that. Let's get really practical. I know several people that have clinically died. Uh, In fact, not that long ago, I spoke to an old friend of mine, and he told me, I used to be actually a a man that uh, uh, I used to hang around with when I was a teenager. And uh, he was was somebody who, uh, uh, who was really a great influence in my life back in the days when I first started walking with God, he was a great influence on my life. Um, and and uh, I spoke to him not that long ago, me that over the, over the, he said, he told me he's been through a lot. And he said that he actually died 30 times. He had 30 cardiac arrests 
he went into cardiac arrest 30 times. I'm not talking about 13. I'm talking about three zero, 30 times. So does that mean that, okay, so he, you know, the first time it happened with him when he had a cardiac arrest, he literally and clinically died and he was resuscitated. Rest, you know, in the hospital, the defib machines and everything, the shockers and all that kind of thing. And he was resuscitated. Does that give him the right to go home now and say, oh, guess what, honey? I, I, I died. I had, I had arrest. You're not my wife anymore. Sorry. And the, the children, sorry, but I, I'm marrying another woman now. Of course not. Of course not. The idea is that that law about death and remarriage is assuming that the husband stays dead, not gets, re not gets resurrected or resuscitated. It's obviously assuming the husband stays dead. I know, I don't know how many people they've had cardiac arrests. Rush to the hospital. Excuse me, rush to the hospital and resuscitated. Does that mean they can go go home and say, oh, "I'm sorry, I'm died. I, I died. I died. So I'm released from the marriage uh, covenant now, and now I can marry somebody else." Of course not. Right. So it assumes that law assumes that the husband stays dead. Otherwise, it'd be a total mess in the world. It wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't be God, it wouldn't be of God. It would be chaotic. You'd have someone like my friend that would that would get married 30 times and lots of children that are fatherless. That's not God. That's not God. So that's that's a, in, that's it in a nutshell. I mean, I can go into more detail. We can pull up the scriptures and all that kind of thing. But number one is it doesn't fit the profile of, of Deuteronomy twenty four. You look at it for what it actually says and what they're trying to make it say. It doesn't it doesn't match. Second of all, it, God is not into this kind of thing where it's like, oh, you know what, you, you know what I yeah, I heard. I know people might argue one way or another, but I've heard this for a long time. They say. Medically speaking, you die every time you sneeze. When you when you sneeze, your heart stops for a second. You stop. You, everything stops for a second. I know this sounds crazy. I know this is extreme, but where do you draw the line? That's what I'm saying. Where do you draw the line? Does that mean you get married and then guess what? You know you. It's, you know, you have hay fever and, you know, you go outside and you sneeze and, well, sorry, honey, I, you see, I died for, you know, 500 milliseconds there and uh, our marriage is over. I know that sounds crazy. I know it's crazy, extreme, but where do you draw the line? I think the only reasonable, reasonable line to draw is to say, the law apply that law applies when the husband dies and stays dead. Okay, that, that husband stays dead at least for the duration of your life. I know someone might argue, well, the resurrection is coming soon. At least for the duration of your life, the rest of your life, that or the wife. You know, if the wife dies, you know, at least if she stays dead, at least for the duration of your life, then you're, you're you know, that would I think that that law would apply, but otherwise. It doesn't make any sense. I believe that the the person who come up with that, I haven't put a, I haven't, I can't put my finger on who it was, but it's definitely not. You don't read this doctrine in early Christian literature, as far as I know. I believe that the person who came up with this, whoever whoever it is, actually made it up. Because maybe not intentionally making it up, but probably somebody who was a Torah observant 
Christian or Torah observant, you know, Hebrew roots, and probably came to the realization that all of the selling points for their salvation of why they need Jesus is wrong. Like, oh, well, you need him because he's the only one that can obey the law. Well, sorry, you can obey the law. It's, it's easy to obey. Oh, well, that, there goes that one. Well, you need Jesus because um, it's his blood that covers your sin. Well, in the Old Testament, blood didn't always cover sin. Well, there goes that one. And so they're looking, I, I believe, uh, at least, I have a hunt. I, I, I suspect, let me just put it that way. I suspect that that doctrine comes from someone who understands the Torah well enough to know that the selling points of Christianity are all wrong, and they, they're looking for, oh, we have to have a Jesus came. We have to have a reason why he had to die. So he had to die so that he could remarry Israel. That's what I suspect. That's what I suspect. A-N-B-U, thank you for your question. I appreciate that. Excellent question. Yes, Isaac says, but to clarify about Paul, I think he gives a, his personal advice. And let me let me just say as well, just because Paul gives his own personal advice that's not the will of God, it does that doesn't mean it's it's wrong either. That doesn't mean it's wrong. You know, it could be it could be good advice. You know, you get lots of people who give really good advice that's not really thus saying the Lord. Really good advice though. It should be weighed up with one's personal circumstances. Yeah, and, uh, due to the phrase. By the by the by way of concession, yes, absolutely. Billy, you, you nailed it right there for sure. Anytime you speak negatively about Paul, and I'm really not all that, you know, I'm anytime I <laughs> yeah, anytime I, you know, there's any hint of negativity against Paul, is people will attack me. Yeah. Uh it shows where their allegiance lies, yeah. Paulians, right? That's why I call them Paulians. They're not Christians. They don't worship Christ. They don't follow Christ. They don't go by the teachings of Christ. They go by the teachings of Paul. They're Paulians. How dare you touch Paul? I even, well, what was this? This was like several months ago, but it, the video is still up somewhere. I forget what's, I, it, we do videos every day. I even forget what, what date it is. But some of you might remember that, uh, uh, remember that person that came on? Actually, it was a, a comment that was left on YouTube, and I put I I posted it up on the screen. It was a person who was com like just completely upset with me, just completely irate, basically calling me all kinds of names, or at least being upset with me. And the 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 accusation was listen. The accusation that they accuse me of is, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of the exact wording. I know it was like, you don't believe in the deity of Paul. That's what they say. They use that phrase, deity of Paul in there. I'm like, thank you for proving me right, because this is what I've been saying all along. People worship Paul. Like Paul is if it, you know, Paul is a God. Corey says, "Don't believe or don't forget the blasphemy that he's say, he's saying also with what you've said. See, this, these kind of people, as yeah, as we all see, these kind of people, they 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 can't make an argument because they don't have an argument because it's not true. It's just false, hundred percent false, and so they don't have any evidence for it. All they can do is just come on here and spout off. So." Question for move as how did Jesus view God? Well, according to the Gospels, he viewed God as his father. And the only time he actually, if you look at it, it's interesting. Looking at when he called God Father and when he called God God. 
when he was speaking to God personally, one-on-one, and when he taught his disciples to pray, it's Father. But when he spoke to sinners, um, it wasn't Father, it was God. And when he was on the cross, it wasn't Father, it was God. So it's like the, the, the term, I don't like to say name, but the title God is a plot is a distance it's it 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 conveys distance between you and and a deity it's god it's god over there somewhere it's not like a personal thing but father is personal right father and we have that you know warmth and that close relationship that's so what whenever i hear someone say father god it's like Oh, say that. Don't say Father God. It's like oxymoron. God is like, it's how a sinner views God, okay? How the how a sinner views the Father is God, okay? Or like like Yeshua on the cross, where as as Paul said, here I go again. Paul said Yeshua became sin. So he became sin, so he so he's not like you know, it's my God, my God. So, um, there is a time on the cross that he actually said, according to Luke, now this is just according to Luke, not Mark, not Matthew, not John. On, but he said, Father, commit my spirit. And that is from uh, Psalm 31, verse 5. But in Psalm 31, verse 5, that's not what it says, as far as I remember. Let me just check it out. Psalm 31, verse 5. So it could be, you know, an embellishment. Yeah. So Psalm 31, verse 5 says, Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. So it appears to me like there's a good possibility. I'm not saying for sure 100%, but I'm saying there's a good possibility that that Luke threw that father in there when it really didn't happen. It was more like what this says here. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. Because if he said, yeah, I'm just trying to find if any other references here. There's nothing else in any of the, yeah, there's nothing else in any of the, um, the Gospels that says anything like that. So once again, we have only one source out of four that says he said, Father, in that context, which probably didn't. He probably just said into your hands. He probably, you know, said more like what Psalm 31 5 says. Yeah, Corey says, I remember the video you you made on TikTok where you messed up your glasses when you said, blah, 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 righteous, righteous uh, before man and not before the Lord. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that, Corey. Isaac said, did you see respond to inspiring philosophy doing uh, doing a YouTube short response to one of your TikToks? No, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people that do re- short responses to my TikTok, so I, I, I can hardly keep up with them. And sometimes I 
I need to kind of pull away from, from all the negativity. Um, yeah, so I didn't, I did not see or respond to that, Isaac. Sometimes I gotta, you got so many people, you know, that are like that. Um, you gotta just kind of pick your battles sometimes. Okay, let's do, it's already getting late already. We didn't even start, really, James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 1. Let not many of you be teachers, my brothers, knowing that we will receive heavier judgment, for we all stumble in many things. Anyone who doesn't stumble in word is a perfect person, able to bridle the whole body also. Indeed, we put bits into the horses' mouths so that they may obey us and we guide their whole body. Behold, the ships also, though they be so, they, they, excuse me, though they are so big and are driven by fierce winds, are yet guided by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. So the tongue is also a little member and boasting great things. See how a small fire can spread to a large forest. The tongue is a fire. The world of iniquity among our members is the tongue, which defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and is set on fire by Gehenna. For every kind of animal, bird, creeping thing, and sea creature is tamed and has, and has been tamed by mankind, but nobody can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who are made in the image of God. Out of the same mouth comes blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send out from the same opening uh, fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, yield olives or a vine figs? Thus, no spring. No spring yields both both salt water and fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by his good conduct that his deeds are done in gentleness of wisdom. But if you are but if, excuse me, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, don't boast and don't lie against the truth. This wisdom is not from is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. You know, this is interesting that all of these things are in the same category. So sensual, demonic are in the same category. Gotta keep that in mind because there's so much today in especially in the Western culture that's so sensual. Verse 16: For where jealousy and selfish ambition are. There is confusion in every evil deed. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James chapter 4. Where do wars and fightings among you come from? Don't they come from the, your pleasures that war in your members? You lust and don't have. You murder and covet and can't obtain. You fight and make war. You don't have because you don't ask. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong, wrong motives so, so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's a powerful one. Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. There's a lot of people who are Christians and church leaders and musicians and such that have sold themselves over to the world, haven't they? Verse 5. 
Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit lives in us, yearns jealousy, jealously? Very interesting. There's no, uh, there is no reference here. Where, here's a question, serious question. Maybe one of you can look this up. Where does it say in the Tanakh, the spirit who lives in us yearns jealously? I'm not saying it's not there. I'm just wondering where it says it. Or is James referring to something that is in another extra biblical book? But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, here is a reference, right? Proverbs 3.34. It actually says that in several places throughout the Tanakh. But subject yourself, or be subject, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament, warn, mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will exalt you. Don't speak against one another, brothers. He who speaks against a brother and judges his brother speaks against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Only one is the lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you to judge another? Notice here, this is interesting right here, where it says, He who speaks against his brother judges his brother and judges his brother, speaks against the law, and judges the law. So obviously, James is condemning this practice, okay? Like, it is wrong to speak against a brother, judge your brother. It's wrong because you speak against the law and judge the law. And I think about how many Christians Christians today all the way down, all the way up the ranks, right? From, you know, the pastors and church leaders and priests and wh- what have you. They speak against the law. They say the law is the law of sin, or they say the law is a bondage. Right? They say all these, all this stuff against the law, all this stuff against the Torah. It's bondage, it's, you know, it's sin, it's all this stuff. So they're judging the Torah. They're speaking against the Torah. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer, but a, a doer of the law, but a judge. So again, you can see the you can see the spirit here by which James is speaking. It's like, listen, you don't want to be a judge of the law. You want to be a doer of the law. That's what you want. Only one is the lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow, let's go into this city and spend a year there, trade and make a profit. Yet you don't know what your life will be like tomorrow. For what is your life? For you are a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will both live and do this or that. But now you glory in your boasting. All such boasting is evil. To him, therefore, who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. This is kind of an interesting statement, too, because sin is not just breaking the law, but sin is... is, not doing the good that you supposed to. So in other words, it's not just, sin is not just something that you do. Sin is something that you don't do. Sin can be something that you don't do. James 5. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming on you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be for a testimony against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up your treasure 
in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you have which you have kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of those who reaped have entered into the ears of the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. Sabaoth. Okay. Again, notice we have even inanimate objects. The wages cry out. Verse 5, you have lived in luxury on the earth and taken your pleasure. You have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and you have murdered the, the righteous one. He doesn't resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Behold, the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being patient over it until, until it receives the early and late rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Don't grumble, brothers, against one another, so that you won't be judged. Behold, the judge stands at the door. Take, brothers, for example, for an example of suffering and of perseverance, the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we call them blessed who endured. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the Lord in the outcome. And now, or excuse me, and how the Lord is full of compassion and mercy. But above all things, my brothers, don't swear, not by heaven or by the earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no, no so that you don't fall into hypocrisy. Is any among you suffering? Let him pray. Is any cheerful? Let him sing praises. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the assembly, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will heal him who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The insistent prayer of a righteous person is powerfully effective. Or as it says in the King James, you know, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it didn't rain on the earth for three years and six months. He prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brothers, if any among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Cover a multitude of sins. You'd say, how does that happen? Well, through, through love and mercy. And that concludes the epistle of James. Seems to... It seems to end um, quite abruptly, doesn't it? Seems to end quite abruptly. So, anyways, um, that concludes our reading for tonight. Let me just check the live chat one more time here before we call it a night.
Corey asks, or Corey says, uh, there are some Christians I've met who believe that evolution is tied into the Bible. Yeah, I've met a few like that as well. Uh, spoke about that kind of stuff back when we read Genesis chapter 1. A lot of different things that I think a lot of people haven't considered. Um, just um, uh, briefly, like, you know, I've asked the scientific community this um, this question before, and I have not received a um, sufficient answer yet. This was years ago, actually. Excuse me. The question was like, especially when it comes to carbon dating, right? Carbon dating. And the question was, has has it ever been tested that radiometric like isotopes um decay faster in in certain environments as opposed to others because some people say that the the atmosphere of the earth back let's say for example before the flood okay uh was so much more uh so much better than it is now um you know filtering out the radiation from the sun and all that kind of thing. And that's why people live so long. Uh, I mean, we have those theories. And so my question was like, were these isotopes actually tested under varying conditions, like conditions that are like that? And I never got any answer. I mean, I suspect that if, if the, um, climate or atmosphere of the earth, especially pre-flood, was a lot different than it is now, then perhaps these isotopes did not decay as much as, as they do now. So one year could, could be dated as being a million, you know, or a billion. Uh, so depending on you know, all kinds of things. So there's other, there's other uh, things as well. Like for example, the first three days in Genesis, it doesn't say that days were even measured into the fourth day. So the first three days, here's, I'm just saying, I'm just thinking out loud here. There, there is a theory out there that the first three days, and I've thought about this before as well. How can you say it's a 24 hour day when there's nothing to measure it? That, tw- that quote unquote day could have been a 24-hour day. I'm not saying it wasn't. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it wasn't a 24-hour day. But since it says that days were not even measured until the fourth day, then those first three days could have been three eternities. I mean, I'm just saying. Unmeasured amounts of time. Corey says Genesis 37:11. Let's check it out. Genesis 37. Let's go down to chapter 37, 11. The verse you asked where where else it was said. Okay, what that's his brothers envied him. And his father kept this saying in mind. Um, yeah, it doesn't, I, I can't, it doesn't seem to match where it says there in James. Right here, or do you think the scripture says without reason that he jealously longed for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? Well, this is okay. There's a, there's a reference here, or that the spirit he caused to dwell in us 
envies intensely, or that the spirit he caused to dwell in us longs jealously. But again, where does it say that? I mean, because Genesis 37, 11, maybe it says something different in other translations or manuscripts, but it doesn't really seem to sound the same here. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe that's maybe I'm mistaking you there, Corey. Here's a you know here's a possibility. Uh, James four five isn't a direct quote, just a summary of what the Tanakh teaches on the subject. Yeah, it's it's interesting how a lot of the New Testament authors do that. They say that the Scripture says, and then it's not really a direct a direct quote. You see, people back in those days, even Yeshua himself didn't. They weren't so legalistic as we are today, even. Christians who claim who who are anti-legalistic Christians, they're still legalistic, especially in the way that they quote scripture. As I said, I'm going to go now. It's 1.30 a.m. in the UK. Time for sleep. Good night, everyone. Another good stream. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you very much, uh, Isaac. Appreciate, appreciate your fellowship and your questions, your comments. God bless you. Great Deception says, Thank you, brother. Much love and blessings to you all. Thank you very much, Alan. Love and blessings multiplied back to you, brother. Billy says, what's on the schedule for tomorrow night? Um, it's, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm not settled yet what to do on tomorrow night. Uh, there is a few different possibilities. There's a few different kind of off the beaten track kind of gospels that are not in the um, New Testament canon, but yet they are dated just shortly after James. So I'm just looking at is several of them. I'm not sure which ones, which one I'm going to start with, or if I'm just going to go right to, uh, yeah, there's a lot, there's lots to consider here. Um, to be announced, Billy, not, uh, not sure yet. Thanks for the question. I'll keep you posted. This is good, too, going nowhere. It's true. Didn't Mar Martin Luther have a problem with the book of James being in the Bible? Something to do with faith and works. Yeah, he had a problem with several books. Uh, James, I believe, is one. Uh, Hebrews is another one. Revelation is another one. Um, Martin Luther, it's, it's kind of ironic because, you see, Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation, and Protestants are like 66 books, no more, no less, you know? Sola fide or script, uh, sola scriptura, scripture alone, you know, all coming out of the, you know, Martin Luther uh, Protestant Reformation. Yet, um, he wanted to take a lot of those books out of the Bible. Martin Luther was quite the, is, you know, people were upset with me by saying, you know, Paul should be put in the uh, early church fathers category. But you know, Martin Luther, again, the father of the Protestant Reformation did, uh, you know, he said 
take a lot of books out of the Bible. I say just just disassemble the Bible altogether. Put it back to the way it used to be. Caballero says, thank you, brother, for uh, tonight's reading. What, what a great book James is, but sadly churches today hardly preach it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thank you very much, Caballero. Corey says, why do Catholics act so much like they are copying Moses and Aaron in the tabernacle? Yeah, well, you know, the closer you get to the first the first century, now I'm not saying that, because Catholics, Catholics claim to be the original church, right? Orthodox claims to be the original church. Protestants claim to be the original church. But the closer you get to the first century, to the original church, if you want to put it that way, the more Judaic it will be. The more Judaic it will be, for sure. So I think it's that influence from the from the first century that trickled down into both the Orthodox and um, Roman Catholics. Now, I understand that uh, like the Eastern Orth, or not Eastern, uh, Ethiopian Orthodox, or even more so, or even more um, Judaic in the way they practice. Thank you very much, Corey, for your question. Appreciate it. So John says, uh, why does Genesis 1 say God created man and woman at the same time? Whereas Genesis 2 says God created man before woman. So how I read it is this. Um, and it, you'll, you'll see this uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Tanakh, uh, especially in, in Genesis. It's like a statement is made and then it explains it like, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then it then it explains how that happened, the seven days, and then in Genesis chapter two, it explain it, it unpacks the sixth day a little more, like how like more detail. So it's like it's almost like a video. It's like you know it's like it's shot like this, and then it zooms in, and then it zooms in even more. So it's like three different. Shots, I guess you would say. The big picture, and then zooming in, and then zooming in more. Uh, so Genesis 1, where it says he created man and woman at the same time, basically just, I think it's just a general statement that he created mankind, as it were, just generally saying that God created human beings. And then in Genesis chapter 2, explaining why, or how, I should say, how it happened, the the, the details. Actually. Whereas I don't have it, um, the book of Jubilees is very interesting as well. Unpacking it even more, yeah, it's right here. Book of Jubilees. It's also called the Little Genesis. Thank you very much, uh, John. Good question. Yeah, Jordan uh, said to going nowhere, he hated, uh, Martin Luther hated the book of James. I'll never understand why so many people idolize him. Yeah, he hated the book of James, and he also did a lot of damage in regards to, uh, he said a lot of horrific things against the uh, the Jewish people as well. It's amazing. Uh, a lot of people don't know about it, but it's actually uh, um, very very bad. It's, yeah, definitely not good at all. Thank you for pointing that out, Jordan. Okay, so that's it for tonight. Wrap it up. 
tomorrow night we will continue and um and uh yeah we'll continue reading and uh fellowshipping and and all that kind of thing i appreciate each one of you as always you guys are awesome i appreciate your questions and your comments and uh love you guys and i'll see you again tomorrow as always i pray the lord bless you and keep you make his face to shine upon you lift up his countenance upon you and give you wonderful wonderful shalom Amen, amen. See you guys tomorrow.